Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session of Questions for the Nation Newcastle. My name's Sophie Black. I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, this is the fourth session of the Festival of Questions. What is that exactly? It's run by the Wheeler Centre in Melbourne. And basically, over the last few months, we have been roaming Australia, collecting the nation's most urgent questions and thrashing them out with some of the sort of sharpest minds around Australia. We kicked off in Perth at the Festival of Ideas. Uh, then we went to the Darwin Festival, followed by the Brisbane Writers Festival. And now we're here with you at the National Young Writers Festival. And this all culminates in Melbourne on Sunday the 15th of October, where we'll bring all of our findings together and kind of compare and contrast. Um, now, at these sessions, we wrestle with big questions facing Australia and the world today. Think culture, class and climate politics and punditry, philosophy and feminism. What are the issues that unite us and what are the issues that divide us? Do terms like right wing and left wing still have any kind of meaning today? Is the world changing too fast or not fast enough? And what do all these questions mean for the indigenous peoples of the country as issues around racial discrimination, sovereignty, reconciliation and justice remain unaddressed and often ignored? Now, it's a lot to digest, but the brains that we've gathered here today are going to give it a red hot go. Now, I will introduce each speaker individually as they get up to speak, uh, but for now, Please give a round of applause for Eliza Berlage, Zana Kobayashi, Casey Briggs, and Alex Neal. Um, now, each, each of these speakers is going to get up with their what they consider their sort of most pressing question. Um, but then you guys are going to get a chance to vote on some of these questions via a very easy to use little voting tool called Slido. You can vote via your smartphone, and if you happen to not have a smartphone, just cuddle up next to somebody and share and share theirs. Um, or you can vote as a team. So you will get a chance to do that later in the session. Um, and if you've got your own burning question that occurs to you during the session, and I'm sure it's going to in, kind of inspire a lot of argument and uh, you know a lot of uh, a lot of thought on your part, you can. Um, Put your own question on Slido and the best questions will be included on the Wheeler Centre's website and we will use them as part of the Festival of Questions in Melbourne on the 15th of October. Given we only have an hour to crunch all of this together today, we won't be following up your questions here, but you can follow all the details at our website and on our social media account. So, before we start, I just want to hit you up with some numbers about Newcastle firstly, because we've been really fascinated by the different kind of answers that we've gathered from each city so far. So we thought we'd dig into the 2016 census data. Um, the median age is 37, which is pretty much on par with the rest of the country. Women outweigh men by around 1%, again on par with the rest of the country. And 32% of you are attending an educational institution. 23% of those are in primary school, 17% in secondary school, and 33% are in a, ter a tertiary um, institution. Um, so overall, t about 26% of this town is currently engaged in some form of higher education, um, which is pretty high compared to an average of 16% across Australia. So that's quite interesting. Then we need to think a little bit about, given this festival and the nature of this festival, young people across the board in this country. Now, it may make me sound like a nana when I use the term young people, but for our number crunching purposes, that means the ages of 12 to 25 years. And the interesting thing about the population stats for Australia is that population ageing, which we hear about all the time, is actually masking the number of young people in Australia, which is quite interesting. So it's predicted that the number of young Australians will rise by roughly 50% by 2050. So our population is increasing through migration and increased fertility over the last dec decade or so. And while the number of young Australians has been steadily rising, their proportion of the population has been decreasing 
as the population has been ageing. And this is sort of hidden significant growth within those numbers. So that's those baby boomers that we're always talking about. So a 50% increase presents a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities to both the community and the economy. It means there's going to be increased demand for schools and teachers and services and activities, but these are going to compete with expenditure demands from the ageing population for pensions and healthcare and aged services. And so also keep in mind that more people are retiring from the workforce than entering it, given that population skew. So according to census stats, and these are 2011 because they haven't quite been updated, but they're still very relevant, compared with young adults 35 years ago, young adults are less likely to be married, more likely to delay moving out of the family home, more likely to work part-time, more culturally diverse, less religious, and have way more educational qualifications. Also, young adult women are closing the gap in terms of both workforce participation and they've overtaken young adult men in educational participation. There's a lot of challenges, though. Growing income inequality in Australia means the potential of some young people is wasted because their opportunities are reduced. Young people overall are finding it harder to become ind independent. They're older when they transition into full-time work. Education is becoming more expensive and income safety nets are being removed. Young people are more in debt than any other generation and this may itself hamper the economy by preventing young people from entering into other markets such as the housing market because they're eating too much avocado on toast. <laughs> so young people need to be prepared for a changing world of work and a changing world across business, communities, government and the global realm. No pressure, guys. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to hand over to these four now to discuss out of all of that what they consider to be some of the most pressing questions for them. First up, we have Eliza Bellage. Eliza is a research assistant and podcast producer for Michelle Grattan at The Conversation. She's worked for the Walkley Foundation, 2SER and 2GB. She thinks a lot about writing her own things, but mostly gets distracted by dogs. Thank you, Eliza. Hey, yeah, and I did have avocado on toast. Guilty, sorry. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about trust and I want to look at the question of how can we grow as a nation and as individuals when we're maybe not quite sure to trust, uh, sorry, who to trust. Now, I want to begin by asking you, don't have to respond, of course, but you know, ask yourself, who do you trust? Is there people in your life that you trust? Are there organisations that you trust? I asked a few people um, over the 24 hours since I got asked to step in at the last minute and uh, most people sort of stood there and weren't quite sure and the most that I got back was usually that they trusted their mum or dad, um, which was interesting and then I had a few people asking, you know, because I work in media, whether this was about media and I guess institutions, I would a lot of people said they would trust the ABC, which is true in terms of research. Um, trust in media generally around the world, um, especially in a lot of Western countries, is declining. In Australia, it's definitely been declining. You know, we'd, I will say, of course, we know everyone's talking about fake news, but there's lots of different reasons why trust and truth in the media is sometimes under siege. Um, but the ABC would be, you know, one big example people look at. But then again, we not know, know that not everybody trusts the ABC. But I'll come back to that, and it's a good thing. Um, so when you're looking at trust, um, you've got to look at all the different levels on which you might trust somebody, which makes you ask, what is trust? Um, being a public speaking and debating coach and a public speaker in my former life, um, I won't go in through the dictionary definition, but we do know that trust is a lot about reliability, it's about intimacy, and it's about confidence in something. It's almost giving up a lack of control. Um, 
Now, I'll be ending by maybe talking a little bit about candy from strangers. Um, but when you're looking at the control in trust and the ability to give somebody your trust, to confide in somebody, to say that I will give you this piece of information, I will allow you to do this service for me because I know that the result will be good and I can trust you and it'll be fine. That's a lot. It's a really big thing to do. Um, now, at the highest level of trust or a lack of trust in this nation, especially for a lot of young people who we hear about having increasing apathy with politics um, and disinterest in politics, and also a lack of ap sorry a growth of apathy in democracy. I mean, democracy is often seen as the best form of polit politics, but is it? People are asking this. I don't think anarchy is, but. Who, who knows? Probably not. Um, but when you look at democracy and you look at political institutions and you look at the people who represent us, how can we trust them? I work in the press gallery every day and when the politicians are in, you see them in question time and it's like a schoolyard debate. It's, you know, people are often getting up there and they're representing an issue and a side, sometimes just to win brownie points with their mates. You know that sometimes they don't even really quite believe what they're saying. They're just trying to please somebody else. They're trying to get the trust from within their party, maybe within their electorate, even knowing that their electorate might completely vote against what they believe. Tony Abbott and Warringah, for example, with same-sex marriage, just to throw that out. 70% of his electorate believe in same-sex marriage and support it, but he still thinks he's trying to represent them. But these guys are trusted by us. We vote them in, they get into power, they represent us, we pay them. Um, but it's quite um, concerning. And then you go and look into, um, on a lower level, um, police. We're meant to trust the police. But myself being um, a white woman, I generally hope I can trust them. But the story would be different if I were Indigenous. You look at the rates of incarceration, police brutality, and you've got to wonder, you know, can you trust these people who are supposed to protect us? Uh, and then you take it down to the next level. Can we even trust ourselves and our own relationships? Now, I don't want anyone to leave this being paranoid. You know, I hope that all the young people here and other people as well can look with hope. Um, because if we all walked around, you know, with tinfoil hats thinking, well, how can I believe what the media says to me? How can I believe that the politicians will represent me? How can I trust my partner not to hurt me? As we know, women, um, are most likely to you know, be caused harm by their partner in a domestic environment, yet you know, a trusting, loving relationship is often seen as a bedrock of society to have that foundational trust. Uh, so you know, how do we move forward to that? And I guess that is just basically, um, as I wrap up, is thinking about how it's about consultation. The best forms of trust come from the best community collaboration, the best questions being asked, about consent, about checking in with those we love, about police bringing in local community members on board, just as they did in Redfern, um, to make sure that the Indigenous population was working together for community-led solutions. We know that the best answers to things like solving national security problems come from engaging our Muslim Australians to make sure that they are looking out for each other and not feeling like they're isolated um, because of Islamophobia. We know that domestic violence solutions come from making sure that women are believed, that women are not only feeling like they can trust the police to disclose their assault, but that they can also have the police trust them, that they're not telling a story about a man who just didn't know how to have sex, which is actually a direct quote from friends who've um, been assaulted. So when we go back to trust at the absolute final thing is we, as I said, most people I asked, who do you trust? They said they trust their parents. And I said, why? And a lot of them said, well, because I have to. I mean, how do I even begin to have my life if I can't hopefully believe that my parents have my best intentions at heart, even though they might have lied to us about the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy and maybe about how functional their relationship was or is. Um, we still have to hope that they will be providing our love. Not everybody's like lucky. Um, uh, but basically, yes, we have to look at that together and say, how can we find that trust? How can we give a little bit of control up but make sure that we're getting a little bit um, of our own respect back in that intimate relationship? Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Eliza. Okay, next up we have Casey Briggs. Casey is a journalist with ABC News, covering far north Queensland for television, radio and online. He was an editor for the University of Adelaide, stu Adelaide Student Paper and the training coordinator at community station Radio Adelaide. He has a master's degree in mathematics that he doesn't use nearly enough and a Twitter, Twitter account that he probably uses too much. A round of applause for Casey, please. <laughs> Technology. If, if there's really never been a more exciting time to be alive, as Malcolm Turnbull likes to tell us ad, ad infinitum, then why am I so fucking tired all the time? Rolling on from Eliza's existential crisis just now, I want to talk to you about another. Folks, I want to talk to you about dread, despair, the existential ennui that's leaving us feeling incapable and hopeless and useless. I know this is supposed to be a, a, an inspiring event. You think perhaps you think I'm being brash or dramatic or overly negative or cynical or depressing or nihilistic or morose or glum. We're at the National Young Writers Festival. We've got all these talented people here. We're, we're uh, having inspiring conversations about changing the world. But honestly, I'm just so exhausted. Why? Well, have you watched the news lately? Nuclear holocaust, terrorism, just like far too many murders. Those disgusting sea lice that totally ruined that teenager's <laughs> legs, they were totally disgusting, but you just couldn't look away no matter how hard you tried. When the Grenfell Tower burnt down, the news literally broadcast a live stream of that inferno for hours. Even when they went on to other stories, they moved it in picture-in-picture -picture style to the corner of the screen, just like a little reminder of the misery that's happening right now across the world and there's nothing you can do about it. Just listening to Sophie's intro at the start of this event sorry. pooped me out <laughs> real bad. I'm so, sorry. so where do we start? Where do we change the world? I don't know. I'm tired. Just ask someone else, can't they solve it? Millennials are ruining weddings. Millennials are killing the US beer industry. Millennials are killing off the letter. Apparently, millennials aren't interested in boobs. Millennials have officially ruined brunch. Are millennials killing the car industry? Millennials finally show up at car dealerships. Apparently, mill millennials didn't kill car sales after all. Now millennials are killing marmalade. Millennials are ruining salads. And millennials are ruining America's sex life. Those weren't even hard to find. <laughs> That was a very small subsection of my Google search. You see, it's all our fault. We're being slowly crushed to death by our own mediocrity, or so the boomers would have us believe. It should make us want to rise up. It should make us want to seize the means of production, take over the world, and, and uh, reshape it uh, in, in a fairer and a nicer and more fun way. But somehow, all I feel is ennui. All I feel is tiredness. And that's the world that we live in, where young people have Theoretically, so much independence, so much agency, so much interconnectedness. But somehow that's just manifested itself in, in an ever-increasing array of apps and social media networks that only serve to expose us in increasingly more invasive ways to the horrors and misery surrounding us that we can't do anything about. And so a system that, that, that studies show is continuing to demonstrate that many young people feel it's stacked against them and their future, well, it's just keeps on keeping on while we just get more and more miserable. It's at this point that I do feel like I owe you an apology. I am, as Sophie said, a journalist. I make the news. I'm the one that's doing this to you. I'm the one that sits at work in an air-conditioned office. I'm deciding if enough people have died in this incident or if this catastrophe is quite catastrophic enough to make the news. There's been a shooting in Townsville. Any injuries? No. Oh, I'll give it a miss then. Do we care more about North Korea firing missiles at Japan or this report about how the planet's boiling and we're all going to die? A crocodile's just eaten a guy. Can somebody please file pronto? <laughs> I was in the office uh, earlier this week. One of my <coughs> colleagues had her daughter just briefly stop into the office and we're sitting around the newsroom just the journos in the newsroom just discussing the plans for the day. We we're allocating our stories, choosing what we'd cover. Um, and this 11-year-old this girl just pipes up and she says, I don't like the news, it's too violent. And we all just looked at each other, we paused, we kind of went, yeah, she's got a point. That's the way with ennui, it gets you young. So, when all is said and done, at the end of this event and the end of this festival, what are you going to do to overcome your existential ennui? That's my question to you and that's my question to the nation. 
And my answer to the question, I don't know. It's filling me with dread and despair. There has never been a more exciting time to be alive, but right now, I just need a rest. Thank you, Casey. I'm really... Maybe you could, like, take a little lie down now <laughs> under the desk um, and just have a little bit of a nap. I'm worried about you. I really, really need it. worried about you. Uh, OK, Alexandra Neal is a writer and critic. Her work has been published in various places, including Kill Your Darlings, The Lifted Brow and Junkie. She's also a producer for Haywire, a platform for young writers uh, and young regional Australians to share their stories with the ABC. Alex, um, take it away. Thank you. Um, while I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, I typed Young People Australia into a Google News search. On the first page of results was a story about how young people don't understand democracy, a story about youth suicide rates, and one about, one about why porn is harming the children. The articles quoted academics and CEOs and people who are on boards. There was not one, but two stories dedicated exclusively to Tony Abbott's thoughts about the youth of today. Old people have been both old and young and can therefore speak for pretty much everyone. Young people have been alive for less time and therefore know less good things. It sounds ridiculous when I put it like that, but that's pretty much how news media operates. There's this idea that being young is a universal experience, that everyone has lived through the same coming of age. But youth isn't a static thing. And if you don't think that young people have valuable things to say, I am 100% sure it's because you haven't asked any. When we discuss young people, we talk about them and to them and over them. We don't ask them what they think. We don't listen. Young people are literally our only hope. If we manage to survive any number of the discrete events currently trying to bring about an apocalypse, then maybe, just maybe, they'll save us. On the days when the existential dread threatens to overwhelm me, when I can't imagine doing anything except lying on the floor, which is something I do a lot at the moment, um, it's young people that give me hope. I'm really lucky because listening to them is my job. At Haywire, we listen to young people and we tell them that what they have to say matters. And then we demand that other people listen to them too. This experience is life-changing. And that's their words, not mine. Before I worked at Haywire, I came through the program myself as a young person when I was living in northern New South Wales. I remember vividly being 18 and sitting across a table from someone who worked for the government and them asking me what I thought about something. I remember looking at her and realising that she really honestly wanted an answer. She wanted my answer. And it changed my life just a bit. Last year, I got to work with a young woman from North Queensland called Michaela to tell her story about losing her cousin to suicide. She talked about the outpouring of sympathy that her cousin's death provoked, and then about how quickly that sympathy vanished when people found out that he was also addicted to ice. She cared so deeply about that stigma and what facing it had meant for her family, but she didn't think she could change anything. She didn't think her story was important. A year after Michaela shared her story, she's received funding to create better support services for people impacted by addiction. She's working in her community to change the world. Just a bit. Recently, I got up at 6am to watch her on ABC News Breakfast, and she was brilliant and articulate and passionate. I watched other people listening to her and sitting in my lounge room wrapped in blankets. I cried. Young people are smart. They're passionate and enthusiastic, and they want to change things. But they're told over and over again that they can't. People talk to them and about them and over them, but we don't listen. Young people are absolutely smarter than everybody else. We should listen to them. Thank you. Thank you, Alex.
Okay, now we have Zana. Zana Kobayashi is a freelance creative manager in Newcastle. Her work encompasses event production, marketing and project management. From local grassroots organisations through to the state government level, Zana works with local institutions to produce and curate cultural content in the city. In the city. Take it away, Zana. Well, um, I think I'm going to swing this ship right back around, guys, because I, to be honest, I felt really overwhelmed by this topic, and when I first started to try and think about what I wanted to talk about, I, you know, of course, the same things popped up for me, like, how are we going to combat racism? What are we doing about homophobia? What about women? Like, how are we going to, how are we going to solve this? Um, but as I was going through these questions with my, actually with my partner this morning, he says to me, like, what are you doing? This doesn't sound like anything like you. You don't, you don't talk like this. You don't, these are not the topics that you're talking about all the time. And I realized he's right. I'm, I'm a self-described high viber. Um, I vibe really high most of the time, <laughs> like to the annoyance of most of my coworkers and family and friends. And it's my coping mechanism. Like, that's how I get through my every day. I once had somebody say to me, you know, I've never been around someone that people smile at so much. And I was like, here's my secret. I'm smiling first. <laughs> so what I want to talk about today instead, I've scrapped the original speech, which is good because I didn't actually work on it that much. I was living my speech last night rather than writing it. Um, what I want to talk about today is um, celebration as create a social action. Because I think positivity kind of gets a bit of a bad rap and I experience this all the time in my life. Um, I'm not critical enough, I don't, you know, people think that I don't think deeply enough, but it's not true. I do think about these things and I do think about them deeply. And then my coping mechanism is to just like high vibe my way back out of there. And I can see I think that celebration is like an underutilized tool and we need to get back to that. I've kind of explored it a little bit in my own practice. Um, like for example, four years ago, a friend of mine and I, we started a newspaper, like just very randomly. Um, and we had two rules in that newspaper. The content had to be about arts and creativity and culture. And the second rule was that it had to be positive. Like everything that we wrote in that paper, we were just like, yeah, Newcastle, great. Like it was so positive. And it, like producing that content all of the time, it really just shifted my energy about the town and it shifted my energy about what was happening here. Um, I also think that, you know, festivals like Tina and of course the work that Renew Newcastle has done in Newcastle, it's... I mean, you can see the way that this celebration of culture or this, you know, it, you don't, it doesn't have to be about culture, it can be about anything really, but the way that it like, it impacts and it does like shift in and change consciousness and I feel like we need to respect that a little bit more. Um, a particular example that I came across um, really recently was I traveled out with a bunch of performers. We jumped in a school bus and drove out to Broken Hill it's a really, really long way away. Um, and we went out there for the Broken Hill Festival. So for those of you that don't know much about Broken Hill, it is like your typical, like pretty like classic isolated mining town. It's got really big wide streets. I think it was the birthplace of BHP. And they have this thing called cheese law. That is a really big thing out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and we went out there for the Broken Heel Festival, which is a drag festival in celebration of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, which was shot there. So as we like, are driving into town, suddenly there are like rainbow pride flags everywhere, which like, when was the last time you went to a country town and you saw that? Then we get to the palace and it's just like feathers and sequins and glitter. And of course, like, there are all the beautiful city drag queens, but then also in that crowd are like, middle-aged white mining men who have borrowed their wives' dresses and have a feather boa on and are just like, <laughs> I don't know, just abandoning themselves to this celebration of queer culture. And it really, like, I could see the way that it impacted that town. The festival kind of, like, uh, culminated in this uh, parade down the main street. So the, 
the drag queens and drag kings, actually, there were drag kings and drag queens, it was amazing, were strutting down the, st like the main street of Broken Hill, Hill as the streets are lined by locals just like cheering, like che clapping. It was so wild. And my friend who I went out there with, he'd grown up there and he said, when I grew up here, I couldn't walk down the street without being harassed for, you know, being gay. And he was like tearing up as he was t telling me this story. And I just, I think I want more of that. I want us to like focus. I mean, it, we need to know what it is that we don't want to get to where we want to be. Um, but let's focus on where we want to be. Let's like sink into that celebration. And I think that there's a couple of rules about this as well. Well, actually, I just think there's one main rule about it. I think it needs to be an earnest and authentic celebration because I think people can sniff out ulterior motives. You know, like if you put on an event and you're like, let's party, but I'm also going to try and change your mind about something. That doesn't work. It needs to be like so authentic that people just get swept up in the celebration before they really realize that you've even changed their mind. And then by the end of it, you have a mining town all cheering in a pub for marriage equality. Amazing, right? Um, yeah, so I don't know exactly how to wrap this up. Because, uh, <laughs> that, that image of bro the Broken Hill celebration, that is enough. Let us all I'm just going to, yeah, just leave with that. Okay. The feather boa. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Done. Anyway, I want you guys to just think about, I want you to think about what it is that you want to celebrate and how you're going to get to celebrating it. And then let's all do that. <laughs> Um, there was such a beautiful contrast between some of those messages there. There was really dark, Casey, that kind of really hollowed me out inside. Uh, and then, Welcome you know, to my world. <laughs> um, but look, you're all united by the fact that you, whether you're feeling deeply pessimistic and deeply tired and suspicious and you don't trust people um, or you're interested in this power of celebration and listening to people you're all engaging as writers you're engaging with the media you're you, you keep getting out of bed and you keep doing this so there has to be a reason for doing that I'll start with you Casey like you're still <laughs> Why you you're still bed? engaging with the media still you're still part of the media um, why it's a very, very difficult question. I think, I think there's still, for me at least, there's still a, a, an immense privilege that you feel kind of in my role. I'm, I'm often, well, I'm observing some of the best things and some of the worst things in my job every day. And so you, you, you see, uh, you feel a, a privilege and also a responsibility to people, I think. And I feel like it's, it's when you do work on those stories where you um, are, are sharing something important that people need to know or sharing someone's story in a way that that is is important and is important for both them personally and for society as a whole I guess that what that's what pushes me on but then there's a lot of crime and grime and misery around that that you that you deal with there's also just in the in the heat of the moment when the when the miserable things happening I want as a journalist you run on adrenaline and I think that's what keeps you going during the day and then you you have a, a long sigh of relief at the end of the day and do it all again. And Eliza, you talked a lot about trust and you talked about what it's like to sit in the press gallery and watch the kind of zoo go on <laughs> down below. Uh, and, and I think this ties in um, with a little bit about what you talked about, Zana, around celebration and positivity. Um, there's a huge amount of negativity surrounding our politics at the moment and a huge amount of distru distrust amongst the public. How do pol <laughs> this is a big question, but how do politicians begin to rebuild that trust and how important is it for them to uh, engender positive messages? Yeah, well, it's good to get out of bed um, to to try to think about that because, you know, somebody's reporting on the crocs, I'm reporting on the croc that mm. they talk about sometimes. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I mean, how do you rebuild trust where we're a nation who loves sport, we've got the grand finals happening this weekend, but one of our favourite pastimes, it's almost a sport, is swapping our prime ministers. I mean, mm. what are we up to, 19, 20 polls now? Um, Malcolm Turnbull's not doing well. Um, yeah, it's, it's important, like, to look at, well, for a lot of it, I mean, it seems like 
you know, going ahead with promises. I mean, a lot of politics is tied up in did they, how many promises did they break? I'm pretty sure that um, I think ABC fact checker does a policy, uh, they used to do a policy count like on how many promises were broken. I know the conversation we have our fact check, which are trusted institutions, they have like a journalism tick of approval um, and we're looking at generally statements made by politicians and checking the accuracy of that. Um, so, you know, there's having people putting checks and balances um, is one element. So there's an external trust, um, you know, like we've got, luckily, we have a separation of powers in this country that is remaining separated. There are parts of the world where that's threatened or has never been great. Um, but, you know, the fact that we can send our elected representatives to the High Court to check if they're actually eligible to sit in Parliament um, or whether they've breached the constitution for having dual citizenship, like that's important that that's there and that even though Malcolm Turnbull said the High Court will so hold that these people will remain in Parliament, it might not happen. Mm. We might lose ministers. So, I mean, that's a good part of trust is having those external systems and making sure that, you know, those, again, aren't corrupted and then we have, you know, ASIO and stuff, you know, making sure and auditing those things. So it's tricky. Um, but, yeah, like making sure that, you know, even if you don't want to be a politician, knowing that you could go into a different element of work mm. and try to keep, you know, keep the bastards honest to say, you know, mm. keep it accountable. Um, and writing to your local MPs too. Mm. Um, more young people should do it. Phone them up. Um, write to your local residents. Um, and remember that the politicians should speak to you and um, hopefully you can trust them to respond. My partner actually does it a lot. And he gets replies. He will tell me when he gets a reply. Um, and that's really cool. Like, trust yourself that your voice matters. Like Alex was saying, like, that there are people in the government who are always like, we want to know what the young people think. Um, and they do. And keep telling them what you think. Yeah, I think that will help. Alex, you've obviously had really uh, some experience, some incredibly mm. positive experiences through your work with yeah. Haywire. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about the internet today and that it can fuel negativity, it can fuel this idea that you know about every single bad thing that is going on in the world in a very unnatural way. Obviously there's a lot of suspicion around this concept of fake news and that fuels distrust. But how much of a game changer is the internet in terms of elevating young people's voices, especially region in regional communities mm. and in marginalised communities? I think in terms of regional communities, it is really important, although it's really important to acknowledge that um, the internet isn't something that everyone has in 2017. Mm. There's, um, especially if you're looking at more remote communities and less disadvantaged, less advantaged communities, there's a huge, still a huge issue with access to the internet. Um, last year at the summit, we had um, this group of, one of our groups, that was the issue that they wanted to talk about was how little access they had to the internet. And I remember these three um, young Indigenous girls standing in front of this room full of um, people from government and saying, put up your hand if you have the internet at home. And then saying, put up your hand if you don't have the internet at home. And it was just them, like these three people. And I think that's really, like we still, we talk about the internet like it's um, something that everyone has and it mm. isn't. And I think that's really important to remember that when we're talking about these issues, we don't leave those people behind. Mm. Um, but it, ha it does help people engage, I think. It helps people find each other. Um, and we see, we like bring all these young people together to like a physical location and that's still really important. But then they all go back and you see them talking on Facebook and that's lovely. I think that being able to foster those kind of personal connections is, I think, the biggest thing that the internet has done for especially young people is helping them be connected to each other. Mm. Yeah. And Zana, you talked about the importance of making sure, like, your message of positivity was really lovely to hear <laughs> given that we are so steeped in cynicism yeah. um, and it's almost uncool to, to be too positive at times. Yeah, absolutely, so um, uncool. <laughs> yeah, but, but you talked about the kind of importance of authenticity around celebration and, and uh, making sure that something is genuine in order for it to be effective. How do you ensure that? Like, how, why does something like that Broken Hill Festival, how does that come off so successfully? What is the secret to that? Well, I guess um, probably the fact that it's run by drag queens um it's yeah it's so it is really authentic yeah um and I think 
in particular with that festival, like, they're not out there trying to push a certain agenda. Then it's not... They didn't go out there with a political intention. They went out there to celebrate their culture in a space. I think what is particularly important is that it's a space that doesn't already foster that culture. Mm. So they've gone out of the cities and moved, you know, gone out somewhere else and kind of just popped it down in the middle of, you know, rural Australia. And it's... They didn't go out there trying to change people's minds. They mm. just went out there to celebrate. Um, and I think that that's why it's so powerful. Mm. You know, the local people, like, they're just swept up in having an amazing time. And then all of a sudden they're like, you know what, I am going to vote yes on marriage equality. Mm. I had a great time with those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to party. Yeah, and I think that that's... that's really powerful and often overlooked because it's not hardcore, it's not critical, like, you know, not critical at the front of it. Um, but those kind of, like, soft powers it can mm. be really important. Mm. Okay, well, given we only have around 15 minutes left, we're going to go to some broader questions now on Slido. Now, these are the questions that we've been taking um, around to various different cities, uh, and we've been working in concert with Essential Media, the pollsters Essential Media, and specifically Rebecca Huntley, who has been running focus groups uh, around Australia for the last 12 years or so. So these questions um, that she put together especially for us um, is, are based on those sort of 12 years worth of conversations with Australians um, across the country about what they care about, um, what, what consumes their thoughts, you know, the things that keep them up at night, um, and, you know, what they think we should, should be on the agenda. Um, so the first question is, should there be a, citizen, a citizenship test to buy property in Australia? Now, obviously the property market, for all sorts of different reasons, can sort of uh, dominate discussions around young people and the fact that they can't get into the property market. Uh, and that's where the whole avocado on toast ridiculous argument comes in. What, what's your take on that question? I'm going to put you in the hot seat first, Eliza. What, what do you think Are we about this doing an idea test? of a citizenship <laughs> test? Yes, yeah. But the, the idea, I mean, obviously, this encompasses... Um, both uh, property around housing, but also uh, land ownership as well, So, which, which is often sort of hotly debated. My answer, like, I'd say no, um, and why is I think a bigger test, a test that I would apply to people buying into the housing market would be more about, and it's quite interventionist, but what are you buying that property for? Rather than, like, are you a good person or, like, do you know, you know, what the coat of arms stands for um, or who won this cricket test in 1983 or something? Um, I think one of the big problems we know when you look at property is that there's not an infinite amount of property. There's not an infinite amount of property in certain areas. Um, and there's a lot of people who are buying lots and lots of multiple types of property and building up apartments and so like a bigger question would be why do you want this mm. I don't know I mean I had a big chat with a friend the other day whose parents are in the property game and they have about 20 and they love it it's a game they call yeah. it a game it, it has become it's a national sport for, but for some people I've just left Sydney for Canberra and one of the things that breaks my heart is not only that young people can't buy into the housing market alone there's other people who can't as well but there's actually also a lack of property where we have art spaces where we have live music where we have theatre venues um, and actually speaking to my dad who's not in the property game he was like if I invested in any kind of property I would happily invest in helping like young people or creatives to have those spaces uh, they've got a different res residential zoning. But I think that's a bit of question is, what are you using the property for? Like, is this a house or is it a home? Mm. Is this a business or is this, like, a social community hub? Mm. I don't know. That would be mine. Obviously, the conversation around negative gearing is huge, Casey, in, in terms of news stories. Do you think a citizenship test is an, is an answer to, this, to the housing, well, there's housing all, crisis? There's a lot packed in that question, isn't there? Whether you're talking... Um, uh, homes, property people are living in or, or large swathes of land like we saw with the Kipman, um, Kipman and Co land up in the north. Um, so there's, there's, I guess, the question of what's the, the purpose of... I mean, I'm just... I 
flip the question as well and think, mm. well, should I be able to buy a house in Spain? Mm. Why, why shouldn't I be able to buy a house in Spain? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I would like to live in Spain, all right? Yeah, I can't. <laughs> um, and, 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 and so, so it's, I think they're just very different questions. I'd be interested to see what the audience has gone very strongly one way. I'd they be interested have. to see what, what preloaded <laughs> notion they have over what, what property that would apply to. Yeah, absolutely. So you're a f you, if we're going to push you into bi a binary answer, you'd be a firm no there? I'm yet to see any evidence for why we would. The yeah, so SI would be a no, I guess. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to move on to the next question because we've got a lot to get through, but thanks for voting, you guys. Make sure you yeah, yeah, have your smartphones out in front of you and um, commit to a question, commit to an answer either way, yes or no. It's very black and white. Uh, so the next question was, is Islamophobia more of a threat to national security than religious extremism? Zana, I'm going to go with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat that question? Yes. <laughs> is, and it, look, feel free for anyone else to jump in if they want to, but is Islamophobia more of a threat to national security than religious extremism? Obviously, these questions also have been inspired by the way that we talk about these issues in the media as well. This isn't the kind of question that you would normally throw over a dinner table, <laughs> or if you well. did, it would be worded in a very different way, I imagine. It depends who you're having dinner with. Yeah, I mean, is it, I don't know that Islamophobia is a threat to national security. I think it's a threat to our, like, society's peace and our, mm. you know, the way that, like, our cultural fabric. I think it's a, th and I think it's a threat to that. I don't know if it's a threat to national security. I mean, maybe in a way, because Islamophobia kind of tends to polarize people and push people, you know, into directions that they might not otherwise have been pushed into. So, actually, I'm swinging back around. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I mean, you look at, um, like, Pauline Hanson, when she donned the burqa, um, I was in there when she did that, and it was mm. insane. Like, someone texted me and was like, quick, go look in the Senate, and I was like, what is happening? And um, what was the atmosphere like in the Senate when that happened? It was just, just next-level chaos of just what was happening. And then George Brandis gave that smackdown speech, and there was a division of a lot of people sitting down. You've probably watched the video, and a lot of people getting up and standing up. But just to be brief is that in, in the responses since then, they were like, this is dangerous what she was doing because she was inflaming Islamophobia, which goes back to trust is like, how can we, the Muslim community work with um, national security agencies to possibly give information and talk about people who might be radicalised if they think that we're all mm. like the, the people who are politicians are a bunch of bigots. Yeah. yeah. Like, totally. So, yes, it is a danger, mm -hmm. but in a different way. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, yes no. you are. It definitely. <laughs> you're, you're in the majority camp there, Eliza, because the yes has clocked in at now. Oh, 79%. Oh, you changed some minds as well. <laughs> Amazing in real time. This is fun. Uh, now, the next question is, is uh, very, very, very relevant at the moment. And... It is, should the public really have a say about marriage equality? So obviously this is more around the process um, of the way this national conversation is being conducted at the moment um, and the fact that the public are currently in the midst of voting, um, voting uh, yes or no. Casey, you've, again, you've got the hot seat as, as a member of the media and you're watching this play out and you're watching Blaming this play, you're watching this play out um, uh, how what's the quality of be, the discussion been like from your end <laughs> that's a yeah oof. Um, there's a lot that I think people don't see yes. so working for the media Which there's a lot fascinating that, that, that people don't see and so we we get people walking into our office and offering their opinion up yes. and criticizing the the people that we've had on the station and all that kind of thing we've in a way that you wouldn't necessarily normally experience it's if it wasn't elevated mm. to this level in this manner People phone in all the time. People rarely knock on our office door and, and come up to reception and say, I really think you should have more people saying why they shouldn't marry. You don't really get that on most issues. So, yeah, it's definitely been a, a, a heightened um, conversation. And, and it's, and it's, it's a tricky one for you because the ABC have... Um, 
you know, they have to maintain a neutral position um, and they've put out sort of an editor editorial directive to, to, to say that, to reiterate that. It's it's very tricky territory to navigate, mm. isn't it, as a, uh, an ABC yeah, journal? Absolutely. And then, the, the, to be clear, there was a bit of discussion that we had some strange directive applied mm. to us that was over the top. It was a normal... Mm. Normal policies applied to this conversation, as do any, and I guess it just becomes a bit more formalised because there's this national vote survey plebiscite thing mm. happening. Um, but just on the question, should the public have, have really have a say? Well, I... I kind of think the public have been already having a say for a very long time. We have a, a news poll or an essential poll every month or two on this issue for a decade. Mm. And um, that is scientifically weighted and that has, um, uh, that has um, a fair amount of legitimacy through tested kind of techniques, statistical techniques and, and information gathering techniques. So the public's already been having a say. I guess my question is should the public really be having this unprecedented process that has never been seen or done before and has been shown to have just the bare-knuckle logistics of it all, yeah. kind of bit, bits failing and things cropping up that no one had thought of and all of that and kind of thing. just the experience of posting a letter again. It's kind of weird. <laughs> I, still think how it's to do a, it. I still think it's a secret government bailout of <laughs> Australia Post. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, all my questions are poster related. I post a lot of letters and I just have a lot of, like, post-related questions <laughs> about, like... Mail times and or, yeah, Alex. Given that you work at Haywire, have mm -hmm. you? What have you seen from your end as a direct result of this process that's going on at the moment? Um, I mean, for me, it's sort of interesting because we're at the beginning of our, I guess, yearly cycle. So we sort of start ramping up now, moving towards our summit in February. So um, I guess it's sort of hard to see what um, this year's batch of young people are going to what their opinions about it will be and I'm interested to listen to them. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, but every, I will say that every year, um, so the way that our process works is we bring all these young people into a room and we basically say to them, what do you think? It's sort of like this, we say, what do you think the issues that are important to you are? Like, what are the things as a young person in regional Australia that you think are the most pressing issues? And they come up with seven or eight and then they spend a week talking about how they might do something to address that in their community. And um, the stigma that young queer people face comes up a lot. It comes up most years. It's mm -hmm. one, of, um, one of the consistent things that we see the young, those young people talking about. So um, I think it's a pressing issue for young people growing up, especially outside cities at the moment. Um, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this affects the, the conversations that they have this year. Well, a resounding 90% of the room say no on that one. Uh, the next question is, is a treaty more important than formal recognition of Aboriginal people in our constitution? This is a bit of a tricky one because on every other panel that we've had in each city, we've had an Indigenous Australian on the panel to weigh in on this and I know that it's difficult, you know, given that we don't have that. So does anyone have any thoughts to just spring to mind from that question? Well, we did talk about it just briefly yeah. before we started, and I think that we all agreed um, that we were not the people to speak on this issue mm. and that we should listen to Indigenous people and support their decisions. Mm. Mm. And that was kind of a resounding thing. And we decided that that was an important thing to say as well, I think. Mm. It's I mean, important to know when to be quiet. And yes. <laughs> yeah. Just like adding to that in agreeance is that, you know, we had this amazing summit in yes. the Uluru where that statement came out and we've had so many um, amazing consultations. There's been a lot of great consultations with Indigenous people and still government doesn't listen to them. So, yeah. We've got 80% of people saying yes, so it might be that people have been paying attention to the Uluru Statement, so that is heartening. Now, is the Australian dream of home ownership more harmful than helpful? I mean, we've mentioned avocados how many times? We have. Right? Let's, I'm not going to do it again. Um, I'm I, the main offender on that. I will say that about, about a year ago, I bought a pair of swimmers that have avocados on them. And I, when I bought them, I was like, this joke is going to last two weeks max. And it's like almost a year on and the joke is still applicable. And it's ridiculous. Um, but I think, and it's so, it's, I think it's, uh, 
property ownership is such a funny thing because it's a completely different conversation for young people mm. than it is for people who are a generation older. And I think that that makes it really hard to have the conversation because it's genuinely, like, the lived experience has changed so much. So what is that conversation? Exactly. Sort of, like, how do you have that conversation? Oh, I just feel like I've opted out of that conversation. Yeah. I, yeah, just can't, yeah, that I just can't all, conceive really. of buying a home. I just, yeah. like, the whole, the whole thing just goes over my head, sort of, because I'm personally at least, because I... I just, I just, it's so such a foreign concept to me. But it also affects the rental market. I mean, mm. it, it makes it harder for renters as much as, you know, forget home ownership. But, yeah, obviously it has a trickle-down effect. Yeah, like, of... I mean, you know, you hear about these properties that have, what is it called, the locked-in rent where it doesn't change for a while. And I think, you know, housing affordability is still a big problem, home, home ownership aside. But just to take another element on is also, I think what is harmful about it is the tick boxing. I mean, young people, a lot of young people have an incredible amount of mobility. A lot of us are travelling overseas, working overseas. So one element that's harmful, not only the fact that a lot of us opt out, opt out and don't see it as a possible thing that can happen in our lifetime, um, but is also that like people feel like you have to get married and you have to get a full-time job and you have to like own a home and have children and, you know, you don't have to do that. Like, I think that's great as well is that, yeah, like that is, can be really stressful for a lot of people to live a conventional life. And I think, and I think that it's be... that's stressful for young people because I think that there are these kind of tick boxes that have applied for a really long time and mm -hmm. some of them are just out of reach for a lot of people now. And I think dealing with that is something that's hard. Yeah. Do you think, though, that because it's a shared experience that it's out of reach from everyone that those conventions will begin to crumble away? Are we starting to see that? Yeah, we'll all just go and live in yurts on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Never marry. <laughs> Thinking about a caravan or a houseboat, yeah. maybe. Small, those small houses? Like, tiny yeah, houses. Tiny. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to build one on the back of my dad's place. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, it's gosh. interesting for me. I mean, obviously... So my younger brother, he's, um, he's like four years younger than me, um, but he has bought a house. Actually, he's bought two houses. Um, but he has, like, never had a holiday he has worked a lot of jobs that he doesn't feel fulfilled by. Um, and it's, it's been insane to watch him go through that process. Obviously, you know, we're quite privileged to be able to, to even be sitting in that category of, like, it being a possibility. Mm. Um, but even if I am sitting in that category of, like, I can see the path that he's taken to get there, it's just not... Yeah, it's just not a path I want to take. I'm happy to, like, opt out of that one and have a tiny house <laughs> instead. <laughs> Live in a van down yeah. by the river. <laughs> so 78% of people vote yes on that, on that question. And then we have our final question, which is, wow, it's a, it's a, it's a doozy to, to, to finish <laughs> off with. Is compulsory voting bad for democracy? Oh. I don't know, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Can't someone else... Must no, I, really I think it's I think it's great. I think compulsory voting is a great thing. I think even if for just that second, you know, like the five minutes that somebody is standing in the line that they kind of have to think a little bit about politics, I think that that's a good thing. Also, how good... I just love... Like, I really like voting. I really like going and, sta <laughs> and like, standing in that line with, like, all sorts of different people and you all, like, do your yeah. thing and then you get your sausage and you yeah. go home and it's just really and the nice. Cake. Yeah. I think so nice. what's bad is that there isn't, demo there isn't compulsory enrolment. You know, you just mm. saw the amount of people who had to re-enrol or fix up their details mm. during this postal survey. That's a problem, that, like, not everybody has to enrol. Uh, and then the other problem that... It, compulsory voting isn't bad, but what is bad is that we need, like, better citizens, citizenship and civics education in schools mm. to make sure people understand their rights at work, but more so what they're voting for and what politics is all about. Yeah. Because most people are like, I work, how my parents do. Mm. The, um, the, almost everybody has said n no, but, um, and I think that that is a result that's borne out in polls on that yes, question that I think definitely. are done. But I also think if you do that poll in the US, I think they also, the U people in the US say, no, our system is the best one. Which is, a very it's kind parochial. of, it is, it's intric kind of intricately tied in with, yeah, the, the, the pride in your, either your civic duty or in saying no to authority. It's, mm. it's quite... Interesting, but it, it does seem to be this sort of robust pride in our system every, and, and a love of sausage scissors as well is, like, quite key to the whole thing. Just the community, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> this should be I love running the gauntlet of, you know, flyers. Like, you're going in, everyone's trying to shove their flyers in your face. It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, Eliza, you're at the coal face of, of, of democracy. Like, when you look down into that pit, that absolute zoo... <laughs> With and shovel. Do, do you <laughs> still think, yes, we should all have to vote for, uh, for one of these people? Like... Yes, <laughs> um, and especially, like, and it, there's just so many things that we can talk about, but crossbenchers, some of them are very interesting characters, but they hold a lot of power, and I think that's an exciting part of our democracy, that, you know, the Ricky Mules and the Clive Palmers, even the Pauline Hansons, is that those crossbenchers, and we've actually got the most amount of crossbenchers elected in a Senate ever or for a while, don't quote me, but (laughs) they can really sway and make sure that, as we know, the policy doesn't just swish through without getting checked. Mm. Um, And so having lots more people voting means lots more people putting their opinions forward and hopefully more of those wild cards coming in and not only challenging government policy, making sure it's fairer or a little bit weird, um, but they also bring a lot of their private members' bills to the table as well. Um, they don't have policy units. Units They're actually often at the coalface of lobbyists. The lobbyists are banging down their doors. And I think that's another reason why, because you give... Yeah, it's just a wider feedback. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but if you do have a burning question of your own, and I've been hearing some angry whispers in the crowd, <laughs> uh, you can leave it up on Slido. There's room at, room at the end of this process to leave your question, and keep checking in on our social, on the Wheeler Centre's website and our social media, because we're really, really interested in your thoughts, and we're really interested in pulling them together uh, in Melbourne on October 15. But in the meantime, please join me in thanking Eliza, Casey, Alex and Zana. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. 